I've got something super cool to unbox. So EC Masters, as you guys know, the power distribution module is amazing. But this takes the four rotor up a huge step. What we have here is their ADU, and that is their dash. All their things in in U, which stands for unit. When I say PDM, power distribution module, power distribution unit, PDU. So this is their seven inch dash. And it's not just the dash, it's what I haven't unboxed yet that makes this thing incredible. Ooh, that is clean. It's metal. But this one is their auto sports unit. And so as you know, the rest of my harness is sealed end to end. They even include the auto sport connector and pins. You know, you'd need your own crimper, but you know, everything else is included with this. And so this thing is beast mode. Now, of course, just like most dashes, you do have the, or the at least the advanced dashes, you do have your shift lights and then you have other lights that can tell you whatever you want, whether it's sh turning signals or, or errors or whatever the case is, you have all of that out there. That's all programmable. I'm going to be using this like crazy because I had it on the three rotor uh, on the track and it comes in really handy. This is very beefy. It's got nice, looks like mounting here, 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 and here. But that's where the story begins. That is not the important part. A dash is only as good as the data that goes to it. And so this is something that ECU Masters makes that I have wanted badly. Infrared sensors. And this isn't just one infrared sensor built into here. This is a tire temp sensor and it will record up to 16 positions on the tire. It's a width of temperature sensing. So as I learned on the track with the three rotor, I had a single temp sensor, infrared temp sensor for the rear tires. Watch the tires get up to temperature and sure enough, the traction sticks completely different. The important part is when you go through certain parts of certain tracks or do anything different, you cool your tires down or you get them too hot, you know what's going on. You know the temperature of your tires so you can put your life into them a little bit harder because you're starting to rely on your equipment, not just be able to recover. If a tire is not warm and you go into a turn, game over. But in this case, all four tires now will have a infrared temp sensor measuring the width. So it'll be like a video game. This whole setup, all four of these, We'll go onto all four of the tires and like a video game, tell us what my tire temperatures are based on colors or however we want to do that. I have the Toyo Proxy RRs on the three rotor and their tire temperatures are recommended to be 180 to 220 degrees roughly. And so I can now see if I'm overheating the tires, if they're not warmed up enough. The only thing that I'm gonna have a fun challenge with is like the three rotor, I'll have it somewhere mounted inside of the fender, angled at the correct angle so that way you get the correct width of the tire and life is good on the rear. The front though, think about what's going on, is that if I mount it like this, or even the same like this, as the tire turns, the numbers will change. And so I'm wondering if maybe hooking this on to some sort of upright metal or carbon composite, something or another, so that way this swings with the tire, so that way you always know the temperature of the tire and this stays constant with it. If I had really tall fenders, which I do not, you could have it up here, and even though the tire's turning, it would give you the best approximate. That would be a, an ideal situation. We wanna keep this constant with the width of the tire, so we know, especially on front tires, if it's too hot on the inside or the outside, what we're doing with our caster, camber, all the other wild metrics that come into turning a tire. So this setup is incredible. I cannot wait to set it up and show you guys how this works. So if that's four tire temp sensors, Here's another thing that ECU Masters has not yet announced. And so this one's a prototype one for me, but they're about to release this publicly. So I don't know if I'm supposed to show you guys this, but I will anyway, a GPS CAN module. And so this one is different than Haltex. Now Haltex is wonderful for speed. Haltex unit says pulses for every amount of unit of velocity that I'm going. So if you go one mile, it's basically measuring distance. So it does 5,000 pulses in like a kilometer a mile is 1.8, something like that. So there's a certain number of pulses per distance. You can figure out number of pulses, speed, all that sort of stuff in there. It's a derivative of that. That does not tell you actual location. This one will, into the dash, this one is going to tell you the location of your car, and as a result, do all the track timing and let you know all of your laps and predictive laps. All that sort of stuff is being released on the ECU dash as well. So we're gonna have some fun setting that up, being some of the early guinea pigs to it and really perfecting the way that we can test the four rotor and make sure that we can make that car handle hardcore. There's the cheat sheet. I already studied all this before I got it because I was getting so excited. You can use it as an analog sensors. This is like temperature sensors, even uh, pressure sensors because I have five volts output, power ground, battery and ground, ground, battery, power ground. Those are all 
necessary, and then CAN 1 and CAN 2, one for the network for all the ECU master stuff, so it can connect to the power distribution module and all of these tire temp sensors that will all be on its own network. That's one CAN bus, and then the other CAN bus is actually the Haltech, so it can connect to all the Haltech stuff, as much as Haltech will allow that. And I'm gonna add a couple of these C frequency digital in. The important part is any sensor going to the dash is not going to the ECU, so it cannot be used to make decisions on the ECU, but what it can be used is make decisions on the power distribution module. This is an amazing discovery for me. I have been told very little information on what type of wheel speed sensors are on these Corvette hubs. I keep hearing the rumor that they're active, passive. There's two wires to there, and traditionally a two-wire sensor is something where there's a magnet bobbling in between as it senses metal and not, and then you get a frequency, kind of this little bit of voltage, and the voltage equals frequency. That's a traditional way of doing it, but there's a non-traditional way of having a two-wire sensor called an active sensor. And so those of you guys that are thinking about using ABS wheel speed sensors, especially for modern cars, the 2009 and newer Corvettes, somewhere there. The, the Corvette actually halfway through the C6 generation switched from passive to active. Nobody gave me any information on this, but I had seen bits and pieces on the internet and I just said, screw it, I'm gonna melt my whole car down and try this. So what you see here is chaos. It's an ABS wheel speed sensor and it's literally from a Corvette Z06, Z01, C6. And so what you see here is two wires. On a traditional digital circuit, you'll have three wires, ground, power, so the low, the high, and then the signal that bounces anywhere between those or has a set purpose, right? Well, this one doesn't have those. There's ground and there's power, but where's the signal? So you actually do this. You actually say, okay, well, we'll send it power, and this is the signal, but we will also put a resistor. By, by the way, don't forget about ground. So it actually, there's a ground resistor that pulls this down. So it says, hey, this is 12 volts, this is zero volts, and then you fight this. It literally is fighting that resistor to give you a voltage out here. That signal is digital. So all this chaos means a high, a low, a high, a low, high, low. I did it, it didn't work for a little while, and then check this out. So watch my multimeter here. So we're gonna go ahead and set it to voltage. Remember, voltage is not on off. I'm measuring the output. It's going to ground through a resistor, 200 ohm resistor, and then this is just simply powered through the positive side of this. So this is my test dummy, another great use for anti-gravity thing. So I'm gonna turn this on, and what would you expect? You'd expect these two to go together. You'd say, even with that little resistor, maybe 10 volts or 12 volts, something like that, right? It does that on the reverse. What the fuck? 1.7 volts. Now here's where this is super exciting. Oh fuck. I moved the wheel a little bit. Goes up to 3.5. Move wheel a little bit more, 1.75. 3.5. What you're noticing is a low and a high value between zero and five volts. Even though this is a 12 volt circuit, you're seeing 1.75 to 3.75, something like that, right? But it's consistently up and down. So that's giving you your on and off circuit. ABS sensors can have up to 120 or more on off teeth throughout the whole ring. I don't know what it is on the Corvette. I'll figure that out myself. Now we have extremely accurate wheel speed sensors because they're meant for ABS and ABS is meant to detect slip. So it's meant to notice like that slight bit of difference between two tires. So the positive side to all this chaos is that if you have a wheel speed sensor, normally you might recognize if it's like a drive shaft sensor or whatnot, it kind of takes some speed to start going. This is instantaneous and it is very low speed operation. So you can actually see a lot of detail in your wheel speed data. So it's pain in the ass to do, but finally got it working and now we can have all four tires have exact positions uh, against each other. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna have Joel superimpose the picture of Charlie Day from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia where he's like trying to explain things and he's like all excited, but he's like conspiracy theory. That's me right now and that's with the four rotor and this is super specific, but this is how you win races. Or so I've read. <laughs> yeah, I haven't won every single race in my life. But tire technology is the most important thing, most critical thing, because that's what connects you to the road, right? And so thanks to ECU Masters, I got something really cool to show you guys and hardwired something up completely weird that is also working. So I'm gonna turn the car on and I'm gonna show you the result of the first half of what I wanna show you. Okay, car is ignition on. Now watch this. Just gonna gently spin the tire, nothing. You, know, you guys don't hear anything, I don't hear anything. But I'm gonna go. <laughs> Nice. Leave that in there. You gotta have it all connected for it to work. Oops. 
So there we go. Round two. So you can't disconnect things. So again, tire spinning really nice and slow, right? And then, see that? I've hacked, and it really it feels like a hack because there's no information on it, and I feel like hacking is a gaining information type of phrase. I have hacked the Corvette 01, Z06 wheel hubs ABS sensor. This is called an active ABS sensor, and I've wired it, and I've got it working right. I simply put a test that as soon as that ABS sensor senses over five miles per hour, and it's, I haven't calibrated them yet, but so whatever that is in terms of rotational speed, I have the all-wheel drive system kicking in and counteracting the wheel spin. And so you can see that once it hits, I'm actually spinning the whole, you can actually see the all-wheel drive system spinning the wheel slowly, spinning the wheel slowly, and then, oh, it's actually applying all-wheel drive. I have it at zero at rest. And so that's how accurate this car is. Each of the four wheels get a speed sensor that is extremely accurate. It's meant to be accurate because it has to work for ABS. It can tell the position of the tire almost like the CNC can tell the position of its drill. It's, it's really impressive. And so that's the first half of what I wanted to show you guys is we now have full ability to do all wheel drive dynamically based on wheel slip. Also, it matters how warm the tires are. And so this is the thing I've been kind of working on and I want to show you guys with the ECU Masters data. Ignore the design. This is simply just a functional test of the things. I'm trying to make this more of like a race page. So we know what gear we're in. We know oil pressure, oil temperature, coolant temp, throttle position. I forget what the last one is. But you're starting to see it form more into that. But look at this. Oh, you guys watch that tight front tire for a second. Look at that. In too hot. Yeah. That's my palm. We're gonna mount one of each of these into the car on the flat bottom, so it'll measure not the tire coming off of the road and preventing all these rock chips from hitting it, but as the tire comes back down, how hot is the tire touching the ground? And so that's super exciting. All four tire temps, logging, knowing it real time, the front ones are gonna be a lot more difficult. I'm Isaiah Duran, and I just put this dash into this car, and I did it way quicker than anybody else in the shop could because I am a fabricator. <laughs> Good job. I have wanted the FD dash, FD everything. I want this to look like an FD still. That, that is still a weird ass obsession of mine, and Isaiah is making my dreams come true. It, of course, we have two layers. We have the exoskeleton layer, and we have the human body layer, like a T800. What he has done is mocked up the very first version of this. Yeah, the dash is for sure in the right place now because this this just sits, sits in there. Yeah, that, that yes. was, it, it seems like it's gonna have to go go way up. Yeah, just like, like an inch and a half. Yeah, if it was up there. So I can match the top of this with this. Oh yeah. Because that, that, that's literally, obviously, you know, it doesn't matter because you can't see past this anyways. Yeah. It, it really can't go much higher than that. Yeah, so that's gonna be pretty much fixed to whatever, but I need to match this angle with whatever angle we put this up at. Yeah. Oh no, I can see myself in reflection. That's not a good angle. <laughs> that's perfect. That's exactly what you God damn, that's want. ugly. That is <laughs> ugly. Um, yeah, no, this is... I, I could do it like this. Oh yeah. yeah I can make sure my fly's not down. That is pretty clean. I want to make all that out of like plate and have that be in the car and have that part of the dash come into this car which is solid. So I, I want to have this be able to bolt it somehow, not with that bolt, <laughs> have all that plate stay in the car and then the dash just comes in from the passenger side and then it hits its three mounts. Cause it's, it's only mounted by one bolt over there right now. I have a mount for the bottom made. I just got to weld it on. Yeah. It's not going anywhere. And so it did have to come up to match that over there. Yeah. But it's like in the perfect spot now. Yeah, it looks, it looks aesthetic. There's something that it just looks way better. We're gonna cut this cookie cutter shape out of this pla and plastic. <laughs> it's clearly carbon fiber. We're gonna cut this shape out of the carbon fiber behind it and have this mounted to metal recess. So it'll look kind of like it's going around this edge here. So it might wear a little bit. This is uh, aluminum, so it's not gonna do much damage. But I think that'll look really pretty having this recessed into that. 
about halfway. So Isaiah went up to the forbidden corner of death and started pulling stuff down. He's throwing out more of my beige parts. It's hurt, but he started pulling parts down and basically was like, uh, we need to deal with this. It was, he oh, pulled... Look at this. Oh my God, it all fits up. <laughs> yeah. How, how crazy is wow. that? <laughs> I think you guys will agree with us. Carbon's sick, but we don't need to over-carbon the car. I want this to be a FD. When you look in there and you're like, how the, f how the fuck is that an FD? That's, that's a job well done. Finally, getting the last little bit connected for the front ABS wheel speed sensor. So this now means that we have at least one wheel on the front and one wheel on the rear, albeit they're on opposite sides, which could cause issues a little bit, but not too much while we figure out our traction control. Ultimately, when I fix the wheel hub on that one and this one, the wires are shredded to pieces. Then we have all four wheel speed sensors working, but it's beautiful. You saw it earlier in the video. The important part is Haltech doesn't take into account the size of the tire. All it focuses on pulses per mile or pulses per kilometer. So you have to make sure that you calibrate both of them at the exact same speed. So I have the line coming from the wheel hub, this little removable connector there, held onto the brake, and it's actually the same length as this brake line because the wheel turns, so this bows in and out, and I don't want it wrapping or touching against the carbon fiber axle. So it should be pretty clean. I have set up the front left wheel speed sensor, and so what I want you to do is watch vehicle speed. He's gonna spin that front hub. <laughs> That's the most, I like the spinner. Is that sick? That's badass. Haltech does have a lot of options on wheel speed. Like that one was spinning and this one wasn't. As it was spinning it the first time, it was arbitrarily 15 miles per hour. But this time when he was spinning it, it was only six. So it was roughly okay. half. That's kind of neat because that means zero plus 15, seven and a half, you know, roughly in there. So it's pretty cool to see that all working. Especially when turning, I'm curious to see the speed differences even from front tire to front tire because the inner tire is going to be traveling slower, right? I think we'll have some really cool data first and then traction control strategy from there. So the majority of the audience that watches this, like 90 some percent is younger than me. And so you're gonna enjoy utilizing the knowledge that you have in middle grade school trigonometry for this. So we have a mathematical problem. If you have a train traveling at 60 miles an hour, <laughs> if you have a car that has a sensor, this sensor detects 16 data points at 120 degrees, so from this center, it's 60 degrees this way and 60 degrees this way. So it's got this like really wide fan. And then in fact, there's a picture right here. So you can see there's the sensor and there's 120 degrees of viewing angle. My mathematical question is how close or far do I have to have this from the tire to get the entire tire width from here to here? We know it's 120 degrees side to side. And we know that the tire that we want to measure is a foot, literally a foot, 12 inches from end to end. Well, this triangle is a little messy, so what I did is I cut it in half. It gives us a right angle triangle with a known angle of 60 degrees here and this opposite being six inches long. And so we can actually use Sokata or Pythagoras theorem or whatever. So whatever we want, we'll just put X right there. We know that this is six inches and we know this is a right angle triangle here. It's I've long forgotten. I know this is the hypotenuse. We don't care about the hypotenuse. <laughs> We're not getting high hypotenuse here. Opposite over hypotenuse, adjacent over hypotenuse, opposite over adjacent. I don't remember. You don't remember that? Else. Basic trade, but whatever. We're just gonna go ahead and plug it into a website. <laughs> website. But look at that, a, a generic trigonometry thing to help us determine how far we need it from the tire. Stay in school. That's right, don't do drugs. Let's see what side A is. Whoa. That is way shorter than I was expecting. That's 3.4 inches, three and a half inches away from the tire. There's roughly a foot, right? And so this thing's saying that, we'll just go all the way from here. That six inches right here. Just for the hell of it. I guess it's not seeing so extreme. Oops. So it ends up going something like that. So that does look like a 120 degree angle. And that's how far physically we need it from the tire. So it's gonna look, the tip of this sensor Will be this far from a 12 inch tire that's good three and a half inches is the edge of the flat bottom not much guesswork involved and we just lucked out slightly recessed so it'll be safe from any sort of gravel coming up right here so we're going to go ahead and clean this area off i'm going to be using double-sided tape some really nice gorilla stuff of it because the inconsistency between 60 and, and 120 degrees clean off the surface <laughs> well, i was like man i don't need to do this and then i saw it so here we are with the sensor we got plenty of options, but we need to see where it's gonna go. We know that we want 
six inches from this edge of the tire, so it's gonna be somewhere in this welded area. The problem is that would be the final spot right there. Like we could just set this right here and be fine based on its data from ECU masters. But this one particularly is measuring uh, only at 60 degree angle. So we have to get it further away from the tire. And then, so this is three and a half inches back. We need it about 10 inches back total. So it's gonna be sitting all the way back right in there. You can see it right there. And that is actually right on the edge of the wheel. So it is working and then that's how narrow my hand looks. Isn't that weird? You do have small hands, that's why I like it. <laughs> and there's the other end. That's sick. Yeah, it's, a, it's weird, it kind of hides somewhere in there. Some, something's... Oh, there's a, oh, I see. There's a rib nut right there that gets in the way. I don't want the screen pushed back like that. When we go to trim this area of that and bring the dash back in, I think we're good. I think that it, it won't get in the way of the dash. I could somewhat get to the back of this right here. I'll make the mount for it how it was, mm -hmm. and then I'll just fit this in, fit this in, fit this in. Yep. The camera's kind of close to where my ISA is right now, and so you can see all those shift lights. Everything's very clean to see. And what's cool about having a plasma cutter now is I have big sheets of metal that I was able to like cut down easily. But with this, that's it. That's all, all there is to it. Look how clean that is. The impression is a clean screen. Well, it's clean looking. All right, now I have to hold it still. Oh, you want to see if you can take the cowl out without? Yeah. I'm gonna laugh if it doesn't let us. <laughs> Why would you laugh at something like that? Oh, our sadness. Wow. You're saying a lot of messed up things today, bro. I have been saying a lot of messed up things. Are you okay? I'm having a meltdown. Oh, I actually can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it, I, I mean, I can, but it, this is, I left this in here for sort of strength and support. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't even know how to get it out now. It would, though. Well, I think that's the point that we're trying to make, right? Is that what you're doing right there? So, look, it, it would actually come out. And if this wasn't close, right here, it case but we had a 90 on there when the 90 wasn't even close to what we needed so thankfully 
we have this one. We have one spare straight jacket, which is exactly what I want to be put in after I get all this wiring done. This will allow us to quick disconnect the front harness so much faster instead of the 90 it was clocked wrong and it just was very difficult. So we'll use this one. Thankfully, when it comes to the ones without the flanges, we can straighten it. Even if it has a little bit of a curve to it, I'm okay with that as long as it's in the, the right direction, which I know which direction it is now. But I took the tape off, I took the old boot off. I'm just gonna clean off some of the resin. It comes off actually quite easily, uh, which is a- Oh wow, there's which, epoxy? I didn't think that there was. Yeah, it's, it's actually kind of a, it's kind of sad because it's not what you think it is. It's a little bit softer. And it came off of the inside of the boot before it came off of the uh, metal fitting, the knurling there. Surprisingly easier to take off than I thought. What you'll see is this boot has two lips. So I'm gonna cut the boot back so we don't have this first one. Get straight to the second one. At the end of the day, it's all about making the car make you feel good, right? And sometimes it's the simplest things. If you've noticed, the three rotor has never ever had this clip. I'm always like pulling this off or whatever. It's never had this clip and it's also never had this clip either. Oh, oh. So for like whatever that is, $17, I can finally put my damn hood latch in there and leave it instead of doing all the weird shit that I do. Out of all the things you've seen me spend money on in the shop, this is probably the biggest flex because you know how often these break, but this is how much I want to make the four rotor look good. Yeah, I did it. I bought these. OEM, these vents shatter into a billion pieces just looking at them. I just want the car to look good since Isaiah put so much effort into making everything else on that dash look good. Now the dash is a fraction of what it used to be. It's at least these two side ones we can put in and then leave them in. Isaiah and I both have concluded that our neighbors are doing something that they could be doing much faster with better tools. Well, you can see why they break. You hook that part <laughs> under there. <laughs> yeah, it actually makes this whole thing more rigid. That's awesome. That was not an uh, intended consequence. Is this one longer or are you missing a piece? Oh, you're observant. This is the piece that... Oh, you have it. Okay. So, there's a bolt. Anybody removing an FD dash, there's a bolt right there. And so you leave these two pieces essentially plugged in forever, but that middle one you pop off and break. All three of these things break for totally different reasons. And it's unfortunate. Wow, that's terrifying. I think that LBR guy actually makes a metal version of those, but a surprise to me that the OEM ones were actually not for sale. So that looks so much better on the dash, especially when you're looking in through the windshield and everything. Everything underneath the dash, underneath this hollow shell of nothing, is uh, solidified and ready to go. Rob did, you know, pretty much redid the whole wiring. It took all day, he was crying and everything. It felt really bad for him. The cool part is, is that this all just kind of flops on and over. I think cares more about that guy that died in the animated than his RX-8. Don't try to make fun of Ren Goku like that, bro. Ah. That baby's not going anywhere. Here you go, bro. I'll, I'll give you the honors. Silver this is This is a big moment. Anybody that owns an FD and has modified it or tried to play with it, Isaiah gave me this moment. Wow. Yeah. Look at this. There's not even a gap in here. Look at that. That looks, it looks so good. I'm so happy with it. It's street car, baby. Street car. <laughs> that, that's, this is a street car. It has wheels, you know, an engine, doors and windows, drives on the street. That's, that's a street car. So Isaiah has serious doubts about this, but I believe. I believe that these actually do fit on the car. I've never done it Yeah, you did. I've never Off camera, of course you did. Why are you trying to use like a bad guy? You are a bad guy. Okay, so let's make sure that the thing can activate. Yeah, no issue on that one. Let's see if the other side. Not mounted on there solidly, but let's see if it... Okay, that car looks 
good. One of the best pieces. This trim to me is this type of stuff that makes the FD an FD. Like whenever you get in and out of an FD, it's like three levels of like rubberized seals. It just, it feels so nice when you do that. There. And so favorite part, big difference between FC and FD. Isaiah's about to cut something very critical to me. It's very impossible to replace. It's the upper part of the steering column. So enjoy this irreversible moment. I'm gonna look the other way. The final piece. Yeah, it has for my entire adult life. Even with the door panel back in and everything, it's just all like oh. right there, yeah. It feels so good being in like an FD again, even though it's not. While I'm working on the dash, I got this working. Boom. Oh. Yeah, so that looks beautiful. Now, the interesting thing I'm doing right now is the bottom corner here is gonna be the fuel level gauge. Now, the cool part is on this, you can actually add tons of ticks. The only unit I can't add is a quarter past half minus a third, which is Joel's favorite measurement for fuel levels. <laughs> I promise I say this would be good. <laughs> Isaiah asked Joel how much fuel was in something. He's like, it's a quarter past a half. I said a quarter and a half, okay? A quarter. Yeah. It's a quarter and a so, half of another quarter. Yeah, so so ECU Masters, are, you oh know, for God. his unit, he's the only person that uses that unit. I don't know but, what I was expecting with that. Yeah, that was yeah. not it. To accommodate him, I'm just gonna keep adding units. There you go. Oh, there you go. There, there, there it is. A quarter plus a half. Yeah. We have a fuel level on the little 10 gallon tank, and Isaiah's gonna go ahead and start adding fuel, and we'll see if it goes up to 100. Yeah, there it goes. Oh, it disappeared. What? <laughs> Maybe I have the units backwards? You got a leak, dude. Yeah. This is hilarious. This is the nature of trying to get systems to work with each other. You guys, you guys get the idea. Uh, it's full. Yeah, it's full. I'm curious why along the way, because I, I took the sensor out and actually had it going, like I physically took the little bobber thing, put it to the very top, took it to the very bottom, and got the range. The signal might be a little bit bad because I don't actually have a ground on there, because I was a little worried about having a ground for sensor grounds, ground to the entire chassis, and I, I didn't like that. Regardless, I think we're, it's working. But if you look up Haltech CAN protocol version whatever, this is the sort of chaos that you, you'll get used to. But this is actually the information I need badly. For those of you guys who are not familiar with CAN bus, it is very intimidating to start. But from a computer background, it actually makes a lot of sense. Right here, I know that my all-wheel drive sensor is one of these three generic sensors. I'm going to have to go to this base of 0x3E7. So you don't have to get too crazy into it, but we're going to go to that base. And so this is like the old game genie. I'm actually gonna be looking at these and watching when I press the all-wheel drive system, those number changed. See that? 04, and those went all the way up to 8A. That right there, sensor one, which is the first two digits here, or first two you know blocks, is the sensor I'm looking for. The ECU Masters has a lot of the stock setups already, but now I have to add a CAN bus input. ECU all-wheel drive. Well, all I did here was 3E0 plus 7, apparently, so it's 3E7. So then there's that data again. Thankfully, the ECU masters let you see those in real time, because uh, one of the things I had a hard time with my AEM was that you had to send it to the dash, it took like two minutes, and then it, you couldn't tell if it was working. So we now know that it's these two right here, ECU all-wheel drive. Now, it doesn't have any units or anything like that, but it's saying three to four, and then when I press the full, goes up to some 138. Now this is traditionally, what's really cool about this is that these are great numbers. These numbers are actually in bar. The system ha always has a couple PSI or bar pressure. 14 PSI is one bar. And so when you see this much, I can work backwards and I know what I'm, I know what I'm expecting. This is a very high power sensor. It's I think 500 PSI. Yeah, I want to have this go basically uh, do all the conversions. So that way it says zero to 100% all wheel drive. So that way you know 
is it 50 50 or whatever and i want to have that kind of sitting inside this little thing right here and so it shows how much is going to the front and rear but you see that getting the data there is the first step but now we have it where the all-wheel drive system and there it is technically 100 percent but got that extra one it's like turning it up to 11. i'll show you guys not only that when I go to the dynamic level, watch this, I'll go to say, we'll say 50%. And so you can hear the all the drive system and there's 45%, say 15%, as it is actually very low. Uh, we'll do 20% and you can see that, that there's a scaling of this that we'll have to work on it, but so we'll say 70% and there's 70%. So that way you can say how much is, what percentage uh, of, of all wheel driveness are you going? So very exciting. Very, very excited. Joel was asking me some questions and ended up leading me on a better path. Check this out. So we have a vertical bar that will show the percentage of all the drive, which is way more useful than the, the raw number. I'm going to have that probably sitting somewhere over here. That draws the picture better than you could ever imagine. The specific numbers in this don't matter as much. It's been Joel's dream moment for the last probably five months. He's, he's been doing <laughs> everything else in the shop, helping out just... <laughs> See these? I've not showed him these yet. It's the Haltech button stickers. Badass. Uh, I was impressed that they have an all-wheel drive button. I want to make sure I can quickly see this. Start, stop, hazards, kicking the fans into overdrive. Of course, you know, enable swearing module. That's, That's my favorite button right there. Death. Yeah, death. I like death more than words. I, I don't want... Yeah. Oh, that's kind of sick. Oh, that's actually pretty cool. Yeah, flex capacitor. Look, these are awesome. Of course, page up, page down. That's a big uh, Mighty Car Mods thing with Haltech. In theory, we could have like the turn signals and whatnot. I think we could actually have these light up. We don't. You could press them to t turn because the, the turn signals are going through the ECU. Mm -hmm. So you could have, but you could have it where they they're the things that right. light up on the dash. Oh wow! Uh, as because it, it's a man, we have it manually mm -hmm. set up. So now I feel finally safe enough with the thing mounted there. I'm gonna maybe reorganize some of the buttons. I've known some of them by heart, so they're kind of stuck there now. Oh, that way, quick touch and away we go so i'm gonna start putting these on there joel has been begging me to do this and <laughs> even from the previous shot he won't leave me alone until i put one sticker on there and any of you guys I, I guarantee the guys that watch this channel have that fear of stickers like when you had your lego set putting those stickers on was life or death <laughs> like it had to be perfect and you'd never get it perfect and so that's it's kind of the fear i have right at this moment and joel's forcing me to face my fear that's actually pretty I like it. Yeah, me too. So I've got start and stop, all the drive, and then clearing off error codes, and then fan override. Those are, those are the main ones I want to, to make sure I have. We're switching the tires from the C5 over to the four rotor, the ones that we infamously did the all wheel drive burnout on. Well, things have changed. Everything's working really well now. The problem is switching back to those, the brake caliper hits the inside of the rim. So we- You can see it too. Yeah, you can see it. And it must have at some point back then too. That's no bueno. So what we're gonna do is bring the caliper closer to the rotor. Now we do have some wiggle room there, very slight, but some. So I'm gonna put these on the mill and take them down in about 50 thousandths. Moving better. We gained two things there. One is the, the brake pad is now covering more of the rotor. So if the rotor is this crescent moon shape here, the pad was just sitting outward about 50 thousandths, as you saw. And so we just shifted it inward. So we're gaining, it's, it's a shorter radius. So it's not as much braking power, but we're doing it properly. And it allows us to fit way more tires onto the car. So this is a very exciting moment for us. All four wheel speed sensors are independently operating. I have them logging at one millisecond per pulse. A thousand times a second, we'll be able to see data. Hopefully the, the computer lets me do that. But what I'm expecting to see is each tire moving slightly different speeds, maybe a little bit while turning. And we'll take a look at that. And then also braking. Hey, do the fronts stop for the rears? You kind of actually want the fronts to lock up before the rears just slightly, but you balance that out. I think we can do all of this sort of data and make the car really capable of sticking to the ground with having four wheel speed sensors from an ABS system. So we're gonna go ahead, get the car calibrated. We're gonna drive it around here like the normal loop. But what I'm doing is watching to see what's the baseline. When all four tires are touching the ground and moving, maybe the front diff gear ratio is slightly different. We wanna make sure that all four tires, when it's not slipping, 
are at the correct calibration. This is the first time we've really got to do this properly, right? It doesn't, oh, it does let you do it. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> hey, all four sensors are working though. That's about us. You're barely even moving. It's cool that they picked that up. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and open up like a the GPS speed thing. I'm looking down here and I can see all four moving. So we're good there. I'm gonna go just calibrate it roughly. That's all we need to do. going on at once to like see if there's a difference between the wheel speed sensors now but it's neat because I can see the speedometer matching the GPS speedometer within a mile an hour it doesn't really matter I am going to take it for another loop but I'm gonna be watching each of the four wheel speed sensors to see if uh, you know what what effect they have on each other and then we will look together on the logs as I'm turning to see if we can see wheel speed differences in the front two tires <laughs> inside to outside tire, I didn't even think about this, but the rear tires do the same thing. I thought it would just be uh, turning tires for some reason in my mind, but I already saw that at like 10 miles an hour to 12 miles an hour, when you're turning left, it will say we're at 12 miles an hour. This tire's at 10 and this one's at 12 or 14. And like the two split like about three mile an hour. It's instantaneously noticeable. So we're gonna go ahead and open the shop while the sun calms down to uh, look at the logs further. But even the rear wheels, I didn't think about it. When you're turning, even the rear wheels, one spins slower than the other. These are all four of the wheel speed sensors logging as quick as the ECU will let it. You can see some really interesting things right there. You can already see a differentiation Green and yellow are the rear tire, so maybe a little bit of slip or drivetrain slop right there. And then everything else seems to be all fine. Whatever the red tire is seems to be a little bit different. And you can see, like, just even t the slightest bit of turning automatically affects the car. Now, look at this. What oh. the hell? The tires completely diverge. Look at how accurate that is. That's each tire's speed. So as soon as I start to turn, the red and yellow are rear right and front right. As I turn left, the inner tires slow down a little bit and the outer tires speed up. Look at the slip, the yellow one. It's slipping, you know, as it's turning or whatever the case may be. The diff buckling back and forth between the two, road conditions, all of that sort of stuff play factor. And we can see this clear as day. This is utterly impressive. So you can see the harder I turn, the more they diverge and then the less of a turn, they stop doing that. Look at the data. We can tell so much about this car now because of how accurate this data actually is. So it looks like the, the ECU outputs it every 20 milliseconds. The sensors are reading way faster, mm -hmm. but the ECU is calculating it based on the pulses. And so every 20 milliseconds, we're getting data about the thing. So I can slow down the, the logging because it's not gonna give me any more data. That is such accurate data all the way from start to finish on those tires. That is incredible. I did not expect, I did not expect both inner tires to change speeds. That really blows my mind. One more thing we were just talking about off camera is wheel slip and all that. And I realized that because both front and rears are slipping the same, wheel slip is virtually nominal. But this red line here, this is lateral G. So it's how hard the you're being pulled to the side. This confirms the wheel speed things because as soon as I start turning hard, tires start to separate in speeds. And then a, this is a less of a turn and you see it's returning back to normal, and then a harder turn again splits the wheel speeds up more. So these do kind of mimic each other, the harder the turn or the more aggressive turn. There's correlation, it's almost like a, you guys that are no calculus know that this is like a rate change, so it's relative. Now what we're gonna do now is something a little fun. Isaiah's gonna watch the car and down the middle of the road. I'm gonna go to maybe 20, 25 miles an hour and slam on the brakes, and we're gonna see if you guys and Isaiah can tell which brakes lock up first. And it's purposely, we're gonna slam on the brakes to lock 
whatever, all four up, but we can actually see now which tires lock up first and then tune the brakes accordingly. Rob is a lock up king. You ready for this? I'm excited to see the car just come to a shed. So here we are, all four wheel speed sensors, and then slam on the brakes, and the yellow and the green stop first. Yellow being rear right, green being rear left. So the rear is locked up way before the front, which is bad. You want the fronts always to have like a little bit more grip, and if you lock the rears, the car can go sliding like this, where if you lock the fronts, you have you know, more control over the understeer and shit like that. So the fronts, they actually slow down. They never even locked up. We want slightly the reverse of this. And what's neat is not only do we want the reverse of this, we want it where it almost never gets to that, but it's close. It's a fine tune between the front and the rear. But if we have the exact opposite we want, and the problem is there might be some air in the system or something like that, one of the rears is locking up before the other. And that's why you can see the car is currently sitting on an angle. Data. This is just absolutely incredible. We would have never known that. Yeah, we would have never known that. It would have all been speculation yep. or, or 10 years or 20 years of yep. experience with doing this. So what he's doing right now is tightening the bar, the balance bar. So it's bringing the pedal closer to the front calipers than the rears. It's a balancing bar that's pushed in the middle and the closer it is to one side, the more it's gonna leverage that side. You know, shorter distance, it's trying to push that one and the other one kind of has less to do. So we're gonna move it a reasonable amount and then see if our stopping distance shortens and our tires lock up at a more predictable, appropriate manner. I need to see the data. Three of the four tires now are all clamping much closer, but for some reason the right rear one is locking up, which means that it's getting more force to it, or the road on that side slipperier. Like there's a couple other factors that you have to play into this, but balancing that bar out, I was able to stop much quicker. It felt really good. So we already see the data showing that. I'll, I'll go by the shop and stop too. And if it does it again, we know that, hey, it's a problem with maybe air in okay. one side. <laughs> Oh, interesting, did a different thing. The fronts both locked up before the rears. So it has to be asphalt, right? It could have been that, it could have... Well, we won't make any adjustments or try to bleed the system yet because both of the... Oh, you know what, sorry. Both yeah. the rears locked up again. Okay, so that means that road is just slipperier on the, or slipperier on the left side. Yeah, it's funny because you can see the fronts kind of modulating the difference between the two of them. So that definitely has to do with the road surface. Okay, which is good to know. But we're still rear biased. So we'll want to, whichever way you went, we'll keep going okay. more of that. I that. You know, we're going to make it more front bias. It's already shortening our stopping distance. This is absolutely, for those of you guys that are like race car guys or more intricate details, you see how like empowering and safety encouraging this data is. <laughs> they both stopped at the same time at least to my yeah. human yeah, eye it felt, you know. it felt like way more in control and then i can modulate it if, if, you know, if we don't have abs you can see how easily all that information helps with braking but check out the tire temperature sensors on the dash we have the rear wheels hooked up only that just we're still testing everything but you can see them light right up as soon as the tires meet and then exceed their operating temperature. Now that is the correct range. So when you see it go red, that means that it's above the range of the tire. And that data is so useful. Just check this out. See what I see. Oh. 